Um, Barbarian days. Let's talk about Surfer Magazine closing. Let's do. So, I mean, it's weird that that was five days ago or so, and it feels like ancient news. I mean, for everything now, I know it's cliche to say, but everything feels like ancient news. It really does. It's just the, the news, dang, cycle. news cycle is yeah. just whipping. Well, it also feels almost, I hate to, um, I don't want to belittle it, but it almost feels insignificant because all of the politic news is in the news feed all day, every day, and it feels like there's real world implications. Well, but I mean, also, I think that there is a ton of other news happening, right? There's a ton of sports news happening. Yeah, maybe. There's a ton of political news happening. Uh, there's not a lot of surf news happening. It's like in COVID, surf, I mean, we've talked about it multiple times. Just nothing's really happening. You know, there's been those couple things. So now when something does happen, like, I don't know, it feels like you you burn out on it really quick and then it's like, I don't know, treating surf, even though surf news isn't happening rapidly, I treat surf news like I treat the other news where I'm just consuming, yeah. chewing, chewing, chewing. And so I'll get over it real quick. Like well, surf magazine done. Okay. This is arguably the biggest surf news story of 2020. Sure. This is the Bible of surfing surfer magazine been around for 60, 60 plus, I think plus yeah. years. Yeah. I think officially 60, but I think he yeah. started it as something else. I don't know. It's, it, yeah, consult- I think it was founded in 1960 officially. So yeah. it'd be 60 years on the nose. Um, John Severson, we're talking about, has furloughed all of its staff as of Friday. The company itself hasn't actually made a statement. No. But from everybody who works there, they said it's no longer in print. We don't know whether or not there will be a digital kind of footprint left behind that they'll continue to maintenance. They've still been maintenancing their Instagram feed or their social feeds. Um what are, you, what are your thoughts on this? And do you have any insights into those things? Yeah, from what I understand, the whole furlough thing is a technical move uh, so they don't have to pay severance. Um, and so ostensibly it is finished. I think they're trying to figure out where to put surfers' assets. Do they shift them over to Men's Journal? You know, I guess theoretically they could leave a surfing Instagram or something up. But I think I think what, what will happen, all that traffic will get routed into men's journal or another title AMI or whatever AMI is called now has. Um, and yeah, that's like, I think that's what they are, right? That's what they were when they bought David Pecker, uh, is his name that it's amazing. Head, that's an amazing name. Uh, founder or head of AMI. Uh, that's just what they are. They're cannibals. Right. And so they went in and they cannibalized. And from what I heard, there was great offers or big offers for surfer. And, they were rejected. He just wanted an obscene amount of money for the thing if he was going to sell it. I think it's probably my understanding to do deals like that, to buy and sell magazines and whatnot. The windfall has to be, in order for the work to even make sense to do, you have to get a certain amount of windfall. So, you know, they don't care about the niche audiences who like it. They don't care about any of it. It's just all too small potatoes for what they're dealing with. And I think... Pecker's in massive debt. Uh, and so, you know, whatever, the $2 million he could theoretically get for Surfer Magazine doesn't fix the $400 million of debt or whatever, you know, whatever the company's in. I think it's a, it's just in a, all of it's in a really bad state. So. Do you have any idea who would have bought it? I think there was, from what I heard, I didn't know specifics, but I, I think there was a few uh, legitimate offers tendered to from the group individuals from yeah i think it both individuals the surf and industry people and that groups. we know yeah or? i don't know i don't know specifics but there was a couple legit offers um we understand i guess this cannibalization kind of business model but how do you f- so like it's almost not even worth discussing like should it have happened or shouldn't it happen this is a, the society we're living in this deal happened over a year ago, almost two years ago where they actually bought it. So we could have all seen the writing on the wall. Um, but how do you feel about it as a writer, as somebody who's worked in print, working for surfing magazine, as somebody who grew up reading the magazine, do you feel a twinge of nostalgia? Of course. I mean, I think it's sad. I think it's, I wish that surfer magazine could stay on forever. Right? Like I understand the business is such that it, you know, it's hard to, I don't know. It was always kind of top heavy, I feel, or it just could never could quite adjust to the digital thing 
quick enough and stay nimble enough. But it's totally sad. I mean, it was, it was, and I not only an iconic title, the iconic title. So do we blame the people who sold it? I guess it got bought and sold so many times prior to so that. So many times, yeah. That, like it, there's no one person to blame. No, nope. but it makes you. When we saw this happen with Hurley as well, you know, it makes you cautious about who you get in bed with. Well, and I think you know what. At some point, people are trying to make money. Sure, they're trying to be service their niche community, but you know, I mean, when money comes knocking, then that door gets answered nine times out of 10. Like I think there's companies which don't necessarily do everything for the bottom line, like Patagonia probably, I don't know Patagonia's business very much, but it doesn't seem like they go all in, you know, always just chasing, chasing a dollar. Yeah. Uh, And surfer was just stuck on that treadmill and had been for, you know, a decade plus. Yeah, they had. And I guess you look at somebody like using Hurley as the example where, he um, now has enough time left to do something for legacy purposes. And it seems like that's what they're doing with Kandui group. Sure. Where, and not just for family legacy purposes, but just the brands they the, want to see in the marketplace and for the industry. Yeah. For surf culture purposes where they're now making decisions based on what's right for the surf culture. And so with that IPD brand um, that they're introducing, it's wetsuits and stuff. Is that the John John one? No, John John's is, Florence and the Florence, Machine. Florence, <laughs> Florence Marine X. Yeah. Flowma, Flomax. Um, but no, IPD was his oh, yeah, surfboard yeah, yeah. label yes, back yeah. in the day. International Pro Designs, I think is what yep. it was. So, but they're not, it's now it's just IPD that they're using and it's going to be wetsuits and all. But the point is that's going to be retail only. So the business model is we want to support retail. The surf shop. We want to support the surf shop. So now they're, they're, you know, making, and with simple shoes, like they're making these decisions to invest in the culture and the community of people who are actually getting into the water and riding waves every day and who need quality product at a reasonable price that totally. is dependable, you know? So that seems like a legacy decision because he probably partnered with Nike with good intention and Nike, the people that were working there at the time probably also had the best intention and they felt like that was a very beneficial deal for everybody involved, including the athletes, including the industry, whatever. But over the course of time, CEOs change, the board changes. You just lose, you lose decision-making ability. And at a certain point they go, Hey, we got to sell the blue star Alliance and Hurley's not involved in that decision on a personal level. So uh, we again, we understand why all these things happen, but with Surfer Magazine, those decisions happened over the course of, like you said, so many decades. And also, by the way, Severson, the magazine far exceeded whatever his expectations were in 1960. The sport sure. grew to a level that he never could have anticipated. And so I think he had no problem, I think, walking away going, I did well more than I ever anticipated sure. doing. The, the crazy thing, I think, about Sir. A bummer about surf culture in general, especially with the lack of now or the void left by surfer and all this, it just seems like the surf participation is way up. All of that surf participation is completely unconnected from the legacy of the culture or even understanding the culture. It's just people out there liking to slide on wave storms or whatever, don't know any of the history don't know any of what makes it special. I think, I mean, talked about it before, but you know, surfing is for me a percentage, obviously doing it surfing, but a huge percentage is the culture, the lifestyle, you know, the art, the movies, the conversations, all this stuff where I just think that, you know, the, the Val absolutely does not care. The Val will never educate himself or herself why they like surfing is completely different than why I like surfing. Yeah. The bummer is that we have to share waves. Yeah. There's a lot more of them in the lineup than there ever way was more, before. Way yeah. more. It's yeah. crazy town. Yeah. That is it like is. choked. Yeah. My thought on this whole surfer magazine thing was again, related back to Michael Thompson was I want to see a proper exit. Yeah. Like this was such a pathetic exit where it's the staff all letting the staff who aren't pathetic, by the way, who are all hard workers, who are all core surfers, 
it's all of them letting us know that they got furloughed, which is also furloughing them is not a cool move. Yeah. Like you said, it's so that they don't have to pay severance packages. Yeah. All of it's pathetic. What I want to see. And so maybe Todd Pradonovich's thing of like doing the political post the day before they all get furloughed. Maybe that was an attempt at a mic drop. Like I'm going to do it the way that I want to do it. But I want to see somebody go out in a blaze of glory. It's a real bummer. We always talked about at surfing at least, or maybe I was the only one talking about it, about the final issue and just blowing it out. Right. Totally. Like just telling all airing all the dirty laundry, totally, just all that stuff. Uh, I can't even remember what the dirty laundry was back then, but it was one of those where, yeah, the, this final issue and that would be amazing. Yeah. Just every, everything you wanted to know about the surf industry, but we're too afraid to ask, right. uh, would be, here's the exact circulation. Yeah. Here's the exact amount of revenue. Yep. Here's, who still owes us money? Maybe. Exactly, exactly. Here's who slept with who. Yep. Here's how they got that job. Here's how they got that contract. How funny would it be? Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Like eight people would, would read it and love it. But <laughs> yeah, this, the, uh, good on top Radonovich, I think, and Pete Terrace and the rest of them though, for, for, I mean, the years that they've, they carried that thing, they carried it far longer than, you know, any reasonable person would have carried it. Totally. Uh, I just interviewed Sean Doherty for the podcast mm -hmm. about his acquisition of surfing world. And it's totally a passion play. It's those guys that you just talking about. He's the last man standing. Yeah. And they're basically like, we're, we can't do this anymore. And he goes, well, I guess I'll take it over. If I'm going to continue to do this for poppers wages, I should just do it for myself. Sure. And, and, so that's what he's ultimately doing. I, I really wish that AMI gave that opportunity for surf for somebody to take over surfer. There's no chance. Of that. course not. It's a, yeah. it's a whole different yeah. ball of wax, but yeah. Rip surfer. Rip surfer and uh bravo to Sean Doherty for making that yeah. decision because honestly it's a passion project. I don't know that there's really any financial incentive because even if the thing is humming and like firing on all cylinders, he's not going to get rich doing yeah. it. Yeah. You know, like the magazine, like all of us yeah. at this point, all of us could just go work in that office that we're talking about and make more money. I mean, I wish who's going to hire me. If you had, if you hired a professional to put together your resume, they could, there's no position way. it in such a way. My resume hasn't had a meaningful, uh, you got books on your resume. You got I mean, public I speaking and stuff. Like people would hire you. I don't know, um, as a consultant or as a, I don't know what. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Something, something. <laughs> People get paid for way stupider things. Well, if anybody needs consulting out there, just hire my new business. 